thank you. Um, thank you so much to um, Ali for that powerful, powerful breakdown in terms of language. Um, what is a narrative? What is the difference between a narrative and a story? These distinctions are crucial in order for us to get to the reality of a collective healing and not sit in the space of back and forth argumentation. So while a story is an account of, of real people or imaginary people and events, a narrative is about the choice of which events to relate and in what order. Narrative is about how we choose to tell a story. And we apply different narratives to the same story all the time. That differentiation is crucial because that means that in the world of narrative, where the choice to include or omit, the choice to be silent or to speak, that doesn't just communicate a story, it shapes a people. It shapes how a people is seen and how they see themselves. And it is that work of reckoning with how narrative about oppressive systems has shaped how we see ourselves and how we see each other. It is from that work that as a former journalist, I choose to look specifically at how the narrative of the um, emotional shows and shapes up in our work and in our worlds. When we think of the word emotional, the story of emotions is often that they are reduced to being not important, that they are negated, that they are gendered, and they are not to be trusted, that um, they are not part of what is a reliable sense of power or structure. In my work of creating a racial healing roadmap, I wanted to look specifically at the power of the emotional and to bring language to how the emotional is a crucial part of a narrative that upholds oppressive systems. Let me share my screen. So emotional justice is my response to reckoning with narrative that has shaped us, but also really bringing language to the work and the world of the emotional and how it speaks to oppressive systems. Ali broke down beautifully how these oppressive systems have been structured and the work that they do to create economies. I wanna move from the often language of the fiscal economy and how that resource is told. And I want to explore what I call the emotional economy. Emotional justice, a racial healing roadmap and framework that I created. So what does emotional justice do? It creates language to identify the role of the emotional in upholding oppressive systems. It treats the emotional as structural. It breaks down a legacy of untreated trauma. It explores how we are shaped by the language of whiteness. And it identifies the emotional work of each demographic in racial healing and dismantling inequitable systems. This is crucial. I am talking to you from Accra, the capital city of um, Ghana. This is part of a continent that has been fed a narrative of the absence of language and a language had to be introduced and imposed in order to teach us to communicate. That is a narrative that uses and engages power 
as a means of reduction in terms of identity. Emotional justice was saying we must now, we must create language to identify the role of the emotional and how it shows up and how it shapes us. We treat the emotional as structural because we recognize that it is in how structures are maintained that power is perpetuated or it can be dismantled. And the idea so often is that, of course, emotions are relegated to individual bodies and individual experiences. And that, of course, is true. With emotional justice, we're looking at the emotional as structural, as having a pivotal role in sustaining inequitable systems and perpetrating a violence in the name of progressive economies. A legacy of untreated trauma. We speak a lot about trauma when it comes to um, the need for collective healing and the systems that shape our modern world, colonialism, enslavement, and apartheid. In emotional justice, we talk about a legacy of untreated trauma because there is the reality of the trauma as a result of the systems of oppression that shapes our modern world, but there is also the legacy of the untreated trauma and how that shows up and shapes who we are and how we see ourselves. In thinking about narratives specifically, this roadmap explores how we are shaped by what we call the language of whiteness, which I'm about to break down. And crucially, emotional justice argues that in order to get to collectivity, we must start with specificity. And so it identifies the emotional work of each demographic, black, brown, white, indigenous, to use the binary terms that this work is often broken down into. The emotional work of each demographic in racial healing and dismantling inequitable systems. And I'm gonna break down the importance of demography as a narrative in creating the kind of collective healing that will be sustainable and that will move beyond what is often performative um, gestures or symbolic gestures that do not translate into sustainable practice. So how was emotional justice built? Through research, assignment, and community engagement. This is crucial because it is through this engagement with um, living bodies, a living people, but in the work of journalism, an entire field whose foundation is about narrative. The work of any journalist, the question that will often be asked when a journalist is telling a story is what is the angle that you are taking? Another way to say that is what is the narrative that you choose to share in order to communicate that set of facts? And that multiple journalists can take the same set of facts and create multiple narratives. That matters in understanding that when it comes to oppressive systems, a, narr a single narrative has been created and perpetrated that has then created an identity that we must wrestle with. So this roadmap was built through research, assignment and community engagement over 15 years and five cities, three countries and three continents in London, Accra, Philadelphia and New York and Cape Town. Storytelling is a huge part of how we engage emotional justice. So I want to break down how this was built through story and narrative. You're looking at three pictures of three specific assignments of major incidents that I ended up covering as a, as a journalist. So on the far left-hand side at the top, this is Ghana, 40 years of independence. The image on the far left is Black Star Square and you're seeing thousands and thousands of Ghanaians gathered with their Ghanaian flags. The image in the middle is um, Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, and stamps marking the 40th. The image on the right is an image of the first president, Kwame Nkrumah. Behind him is my beautiful dad, God rest his soul. And the two little girls are my elder sisters. The image on the bottom left-hand side is Philadelphia. That's the Million Woman March. On the left, that is Eakins Oval in Philadelphia. We're looking at thousands and thousands thousands and thousands of black women who came from all over America and the world for this event. On the right hand side, you're looking at an image of Winnie Mandela in the red and the white head wrap. In front of her, the gentleman in the baseball cap and the, the beard is Dick Gregory. 
And then the picture on the right is um, South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. On the right, the top right, you're looking at Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. The image below again is Winnie Mandela in a white head wrap. The image on the left are the Truth of Reconciliation Commissioners. Um, right in the front is Desmond Tutu. And the image above is Nchiki Biko, the widow of Steve Biko, who was the father of black consciousness in South Africa. These stories, these visuals are snapshots of major assignments that helped shape this work and world of emotional justice. What I want to point to is the single most important part of the narrative from the top left-hand side picture, Ghana, 40 years of independence, is the person that is missing, and that is my mother. My mother would break her silence about a 30-year, um, uh, over a 30-year period, about what happened the night of Ghana's first military coup in February 1966 that ended the presidency of Kwame Nkrumah and is a major date in Ghana's history. And it would begin a series of, of um, military interventions from military coups to political um, um, regime, back to military coups and back and forth. The reason why that image is so important that my mother missing represents the way we think of narrative and healing. That there are bodies and stories and people that are present, and yet there are those who are absent, who are erased, who are silenced, and yet their, their experience and their story and their reality shapes entire histories. So my entire history was shaped by my mother choosing to tell a story about a time that I'd always thought about in terms of President Nkrumah and my father, but actually I learned was very much about African women and that knowledge shaped how I then approached Philadelphia, which then shaped how I approached South Africa. What was the lesson that I learned, particularly in South Africa, that there was a healing process that the world would emulate and applaud where these two men who became icons of forgiveness engaged a process over a nine year period that was about healing. But the harm of apartheid was 48 years. So a healing process that takes nine years and a harm process that's 48 tells a story that we do not honor with our healing investment, the same amount of time that is given to the perpetration of the harm. But it's not just the harm that was took place, it's the legacy of that harm. Why does that matter? It matters because it creates a narrative of healing being done on a timeline and a deadline, as opposed to being a process and a practice that is beyond the length of a workshop and actually goes into generations because you're looking at the harm that has been perpetrated. I spoke about the language of whiteness. What is that? It is a narrative. We have all been taught about how the world came to be and our role in it as African, since we're on the continent, black, brown, indigenous, and white people. It is a narrative that says whiteness built the world, saves the world, and is the world, while Africans, black people, brown people, indigenous people are savages and children needing saving and civilizing. It is a narrative that shapes how we see ourselves, each other, and how we lead, work, and learn. What is crucial about this narrative that we have all been taught, and I want to make it really clear, it is not specifically just about white people. It's about how the world came to be and our role in it. That narrative taught white people that they are the leaders and it taught African, black, brown and indigenous people as they are the learners. One people leads, one people learn. If your, your identity is then shaped by that narrative and that's the power of the emotional is that it operationalizes within your heart, your mind, your spirit, and your soul. So you may ideologically have a different understanding and recognize the falseness of the narrative, but it's created an emotional relationship to power that centers whiteness. And that now shapes how you move through the world. That sources emotional justice, a roadmap for racial healing, which is the book Dr. Gill mentioned earlier. 
So the language of whiteness is a narrative that nurtures an emotional relationship to power that centers whiteness. That leads to what we call an emotional worldview where we see, treat, and believe whiteness is the leader and Africans, black, brown, and indigenous people are the learners. So we broke down the language of whiteness as it relates to the world of um, emotions to give language to what we're speaking about. Four terms, racialized emotionality, emotional patriarchy, emotional currency, and emotional economy. Those are the four elements of the language of whiteness, and this is what we must unlearn. Racialized emotionality, a world where we add gender, color, context, consequence to universal human emotions. The universal becomes racialized. The racialized is then dehumanized. The dehumanized becomes the ongoing targets of violence. Emotional patriarchy, a society that centers, privileges, and prioritizes the feelings of white men and white people, no matter the cost or consequence to all women and black, brown, and indigenous peoples. Emotional currency, a society that treats women like currency that appreciates or depreciates according to its service to whiteness, men, and centrally white men, white men particularly black women. Emotional economy, a world that makes decisions, acts, creates policy that revolves around the feelings of white men and is relentlessly driven by those feelings regardless of the harm to the health of a nation. It functions to sow division, to plant seeds that segregate, and to spin narratives that separate. So if you're going to unlearn the language of whiteness, what do you replace it with? We call them the emotional justice love languages. We use love language intentionally because it's about an affirmation, an affirming, and, a, and a, a creating a practice that allows you to move from what you must unlearn and replace it with something new. There are four. Intimate reckoning, intimate revolution, resistance negotiation, revolutionary black grace. Intimate reckoning, it's for white women and men to do the emotional labor of severing their connection to power and race that upholds a white masculinity centering the subjugation and exploitation of black, brown and indigenous people and white women. That means to stop defending, supporting, uplifting and cheering a white masculinity that sustains the language of whiteness and shapes white men's emotional connection to and relationship with power and race. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll just describe one more and then we'll move on. Number two, intimate revolution. For um, black women and brown women and indigenous women globally to unlearn the language of whiteness that teaches them their sole value is labor and connects labor to value and worth. The intersection creates a relationship to labor about value. And that intersection shapes a notion that the only value you serve is the labor that you produce that is outside of yourself. The other two, three is resistance negotiation and number four is re revolutionary black grace. What is important about these three, these four, the four love languages and unlearning the language of whiteness is they are broken down into demographics. So intimate reckoning is the emotional justice love language of white um, people, white women and white men. Intimate revolution is the love language of black people, African people, brown people, Hispanic people, indigenous people. Resistance negotiation is specifically about white people and what it means to navigate the feelings that occur when you're being challenged about issues of race in order that you can step into collective healing environments and do the work and come away and continue to do the work. Revolutionary black grace, specifically about the healing work that needs to be done between global black people on the continent and throughout the um, diaspora and global Africa. We all have our emotional work to do, but that work is not the same for every demographic. It is emotional labor. We are building an emotional ecosystem and we are navigating an emotional worldview. In order to navigate an emotional worldview successfully, you must identify it. If you do not identify it, how do you unlearn what can continues to be perpetrated in your name. I break all of this down. You see this visual. Um, you're looking at a visual of a black woman's back. Emotional justice, a roadmap for racial healing. That's the title of the book. Everything is broken down in that book. Um, so this racial healing roadmap 
that I, and this framework that I've just described, it is institutionalized and operationalized through the AMA Institute of Emotional Justice. We're based in Ghana, we work internationally and we create these innovative racial healing resources via projects, training and thought leadership that breaks down, but in practical ways, everything that I've just articulated as analysis. These are some examples of our projects. I won't go through all of them, but I'm going to focus on one. Healing Harm, Healing History. So this project focuses our global racial healing across the continent and the diaspora. And we specifically use the um, orality, the ancestral powers and storytelling. So it engages drum, dramatization and dialogue. It has three themes, intergenerational dialogue, notions of belonging, and narratives of power. What we do is that we take the ancestral wise ways, we evolve, digitize, and um, revolutionize them because this racial healing roadmap is about evolving the racial healing roadmap of South Africa and saying that the challenge with that roadmap is it deadlined our healing and it centered whiteness. It was then exported all over the world, but we're dealing in a time of contested narrative about a singular history. No one questions that it was enslavement, but the contestation is the idea that slavery somehow was beneficial even to those who were enslaved. Those contested narratives um, impede any kind of collective healing. Healing harm, healing history, the Next one is in September here in Accra, where we will be bringing people together at the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora, a beautiful space. Important, listen to the name, the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora, because we're bringing generations of Black people together in person in Accra, but then partnering with an old civil rights organization in, the, in, the, uh, in America. All of the people that are Black, bringing everybody together to explore what we call the 4-H circle. What does it mean to heal harm, but heed history? You cannot have a sustained collective healing that is not heeding history. There can be no emotional justice without the equal division of emotional labor. The, re the reason this is crucial is these oppressive systems of enslavement and apartheid and colonialism rested on unequal labor. That there were a whole group of people doing the labor, and there was a group of people who were the beneficiaries of that labor. Importantly, the emotional worldview that has shaped so many of us is that the idea of one person being the leader, one person being the le learner, means that there is an expectation that is always one group doing the emotional labor, being fixed, in other words, being taught, being shaped, and another group leading that charge. That cannot take us to collective healing. And when we talk about collective healing, we're talking about developing a process and a practice that moves and lasts beyond the length of a workshop, but is actually generations deep. Um, this is our work to do. So we are the healers we have been waiting for. We are the dismantlers we have been waiting for. This is emotional justice. That is a crucial point to end on because our training takes account of the narratives that have shaped us, that have led to this notion of who gets to be the learner and who gets to be the leader. And in developing this international institute that is here in Ghana, we work across the continent, but also in the US and in the UK, developing these resources through projects and training and thought leadership with universities and foundations in the US, with teaching institutions in the UK, developing um, um, projects here in Ghana, all of which are designed to say that our collective healing requires a specificity, a nuance, and a detail that understands the power of the emotional in order to transform a narrative that has been singular, but has been devastatingly effective in shaping all of us, black, brown, white, indigenous. We all have to unlearn the language of whiteness and the way forward is emotional justice. Thank you.